So on the previous set of videos, we've set up the background for the instrument, for actually looking at how we do the spectroscopy, the Raman spectroscopy. We've talked about lasers, we've talked about polarizers, we've talked about the fact that we have photons coming out that have to be discriminated. We have to have some sort of diffraction grating or something like that to spread them out. And the fact that we'll need a detector of some sort to pick these lights up. So let's now look at a, I'm just going to say a generic or general example of this. We'll see in more detail as you work with the different uh, commercially available Raman spectrometers, there's a lot of ways to fold this beam around and get it to do what you want to do. But let's just kind of look at it from a classical point of view. Okay, the first piece that we're going to need is we're going to need that photon cannon I referred to earlier, the laser. Now, why do we use lasers? In the earliest days, they used sources such as a mercury arc lamp or a xenon lamp or something like that as a source. The key is that in order for the Raman peaks that are emitted to come out with their natural line shape, you need to have a source that is very narrow energetically. If that source has broadness, so if you're using a source that's broadband, like a white light or something like that, then the emission will also be broadband. And instead of seeing a sharp peak, you'll see this peak that's shaped like the source. <coughs> so the advantage of the laser is twofold. One is it has the narrow line width. So I'm representing that as delta nu. The, it has a very narrow line width. It's like a spike almost. It also has lots of photons. The other thing we talked about earlier is that Raman is inefficient. Uh, unlike fluorescence, which was highly efficient, Raman is inefficient. What that means is I need a lot of photons to work with. The laser gives me that. It gives me a monstrous number of photons to direct onto the sample. So I'll have a laser that comes out. Now, in a little bit, we're going to talk about the sample and, and what sampling is. For the moment, I'll just represent that sample as a cuvette. So I'm going to direct that laser beam down. I'm going to leave a space for something that I'm going to add in just a minute. And I'm just going to draw a little cuvette with liquid in it, just as an example for sample. Okay, that laser beam is going to fire down into that sample, okay, and the Raman scatter is going to happen. Now, I talked in the previous video about polarization. So I need to be able to polarize that incoming laser beam. This is typically done with some sort of polarizer, which I will draw this way. Depending upon how it's made, there are different polarizers, P-O-L-Z. So I have a polarizer polarizing the beam coming in. When I was doing my research, we would have a Gland Thompson polarizer that would fit right into the beam, and then a second one, which we'll get to in a moment, in the outcoming beam. So now the Raman scatter is going every which way out here. Let's draw it in a different color so it's a little bit clearer. We'll draw it in red. Okay. The blue represents the Rayleigh light, conveniently enough. So we have the Rayleigh light, and we have the Raman light in red. That light is then collected by some sort of lens. So the light coming out is collected. And then focused down onto the entrance slit of something we'll come to in a moment. I'm kind of running out of room there, so I'll move it down here. So here's that last lens again, focusing down. But before I do, I need two things in here. The first thing I'm going to need is an analyzer. So I have in here an analyzer, which is a second polarizing element, which allows me to go VV, 
VH, HV, HH, whichever way I want to. I can now control my polarization. The other thing that I'm going to put in there, and this is frequently put just right in front of the entrance slit of the spectrometer, is my filter. I have to have a filter, remember, to eliminate that Rayleigh light. Because if I don't eliminate all of this blue light, so I've drawn the red light getting through, but the blue light is also getting through, all of that blue light, if it got through to the detector, would be so bright it would burn it up. But from this point on, the only thing I'm going to get through is the red light. I'm going to be stopping that blue right there by that filter to protect my system. The next thing is that light enters into some sort of diffraction element, and I'm going to draw the simplest, which is going to be a grating. So this is a diffraction grating that spreads the light out over its spectral range. So now you have the light all coming together. Now you have it spreading out. So let's do three colors. So I have the red coming out. I have the green coming out at a different angle. And I have my violet light, which I had here just a moment ago. The violet light coming at a different angle. So now I've spread them out. Now in a classic Raman spectrometer, what I would then have is a photomultiplier tube, PMT, which we'll describe a little bit about how that works in the next video. That PMT, however, is a single point detector. So you would have a slit, a narrow slit, the light would travel through that slit, hit the PMT, and then in order to take the spectrum, you would have to rotate the grating. You'd have to rock that grating around. More commonly now are what are called CCDs, or charge coupled device detectors, which are array detectors. These detectors have multiple elements, and they allow me to detect the entire spectrum at once. So I just go click, click, I open my shutter, I close my shutter, I clear out the CCD, if I have a shutter. Depends upon the system. So now I've got the laser light coming in, being eliminated here, the Raman light coming through, passing through, being dispersed out onto the CCD. Click, click, I take the image and I'm done. Now just a couple of quick notes about this though. This dispersing element, one thing people often ask about is resolution. And by resolution here I'm referring to spectral resolution. We're not talking about spatial resolution, but spectral resolution. I want higher spectral resolution. If I do that though, that means the dispersion here has to be greater. Well the CCD doesn't change size. You don't get something for nothing again. At high resolution, the CCD is going to be overfilled. You're going to have that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet light is spread out like this, but the CCD is only this big. If you want to see the whole spectrum, you have to use low resolution so that the CCD sees the whole thing. So which do you want to see? Do you want to see the whole spectrum at once, or do you want to see a particular region at high resolution? That's a choice that you can make because you can change out these gratings between a high resolution and a low resolution. There's also going to be a number of different detectors, and as I said, we'll talk to that in the next video. So the core piece, however, of the spectrometer, the core pieces are the source, the laser, the polarizers, if your system has it in it. Not all systems have it. You don't have to do polarization to do Raman, but there are systems in which you want it. Some sort of sample delivery system, the optics that collect the signal, followed by the detection optics. And then of course this goes out to a computer and all like that, but that's sort of a given. So in essence, that's the Raman spectrometer. You've just got a couple of pieces. In large part, back in the very first video in this sequence, I talked about how Raman has recently begun to explode. You're seeing it in all over in different vendors, different trade shows, different uses of it. Uh, a lot of papers appearing. Part of that is because these components, in particular the gratings, the detectors, the lasers,
have come way down in price and much smaller. So that now you can have compact units, such as the ones that Thermo Fisher Scientific sells as the portable or handheld devices. You can have large bench top devices, again, such as we sell with the um, Thermo Scientific DXR class of, FT, uh, of uh, Raman microscopes. You have a range of different sizes, capabilities, polarization yes, polarization no, multiple lasers yes, multiple lasers no. There's all kinds of ways to configure this. And each one can solve a specific problem. And as I said, that's the reason you're seeing this emergence of a large number of systems. So now let's take a step back in the next video and look at the detectors, talk a little bit to that.